Assalamualaikum. Is my voice clear? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We wait for a while because Prof. Wan Jeff is not finished with his uh, speech. Yeah. All right. Okay.
Hi, Dr. Leo. Hi. Hi, Hazira. Just finished the, I, I think, the keynote session. Okay, we're waiting for Prof. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum and good afternoon all. Um, this is para session three for uh, nano fabrication and characterization. For now, I'm waiting for Prof. Wan Jeffrey to come to the screen.
from already joined. So, Fon Jeffrey, can you request to share your audio visual? I think Prof. One is having problem to enter the screen. Assalamualaikum, Prof. Yes, I go. Yes. Uh, we may start the session now. But uh, before we start the session, can everyone turn turn on your camera? We have a photo session first. Okay. Uh, Dr. Liu, uh, Athena, can you turn on your camera? In the count of one, two, three. Another one, sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, Profit, you may start. Okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi and very good uh, evening. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are about to begin uh, our session on nanofabrication and characterization. Uh, please stand by. I would like to seek your kind cooperation to avoid any virtual disturbance during the live broadcast session. If you have any question, the conference resource personnel are ready to attend you at the reception desk. Thank you for your kind cooperation and attention. We will start at, uh, uh, I mean, uh, roughly now, which is, uh, okay. Okay, so uh, good, very good uh, afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first Malaysian International Conference on Nanotechnology and Catalysis. We are now in the session of fabric, nanofabrication. My name is uh, Dr. Wan Jeffrey. I'm, I, I'm a, 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 a staff, academic staff in uh, uh, NanoCAT and also a Department of Chemistry, Unisimilaya. I'll, I'll be with the session chair today, together with the session moderator, uh, uh, Ms., Ms., uh, Ms., Mrs. Nurul. And I invite all the invited speaker and presenter to request to share audio and video now, following by the first invited speaker. The first invited speaker is Dr. Fadlina Cheros. Uh, yeah. Assalamualaikum. Uh, I think Dr. Fadlina is having problem to to enter here, so I will play her video. Okay.
是。Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Fadlina Bidija Rus. I'm from UPNM. My presentation will be the bulk properties and the equivalent circuit of calcium tantalate and solid solution. Before I proceed with my presentation, I would like to briefly introduce you to my university. It is located inside the Malaysian military camp Sungai Besi, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. It is the first Malaysian public university catering to the needs and development of the Malaysian Armed Forces. It was formerly known as Academy Tentera Malaysia, or ATMA, which established on June 1995. By November 2006, ATMA has been upgraded to university status. So UPNM consists of four faculties, engineering, medicine, defense studies and management, as well as science and technologies with more than 20 centers. So UPNM is the youngest public university in Malaysia. So this is the overview of my presentation today. I'll be talking about the introduction, objectives, we have preparation and methods, results and conclusions. So what is calcium tantalate and why do we have such interest to investigate it? So calcium tantalate was first discovered by Jean Berg in 1980s. It is related to uranium oxide structure, which is known for its unique crystal structure. Several oxides with tantalum and few with niobium were reported to form this similar structure mostly with hexagonal and trigonal symmetry, and calcium tantalate is one of them. Its structural chemistry has been well studied, but unfortunately, no detailed studies on electrical has been reported so far. So this is the structural environment of the calcium tantalate. As you can see, the calcium tantalate contains layers of pentagonal by pyramids which is the tantalum oxide with O7, alternating with layers of tantalum oxide octahedra with O6. So there is always a tantalum octahedron on one side and the calcium polyhedron on the other side. So this is the upper view of the pentagonal bipyramids. As you can see here, this is the table listing a few, several tantalum and niobium oxide, which exhibit the same structure as the calcium tantalate here. There are a few different types of alternating layers of pentagonal bipyramids and octahedra. So as you can see, calcium tantalate consists of single layers of pentagonal by pyramid, alternating with single layers of octahedra, as in previous figure. So in this talk, we will be presenting you the calcium tantalate and the solid solution with the general formula of this one, with x is equal to zero, denoted the calcium tantalate, the original phase of it, x is equal to 1, denoted the calcium tantalum niobium oxide with a ratio of 3 to 1, tantalum to niobium, and x is equal to 2, denoted the calcium tantalum niobium oxide with a ratio of 2 to 2, as shown here. So the objective of this presentation is to study the effect of niobium doping at tantalum sites of calcium tantalum bulk properties, as well as to study the equivalent circuit for calcium tantalum and solid solution. All samples were prepared using conventional solid state method, where first all the reagents were dried at appropriate 
drying temperature and stored on the vacuum. Appropriate amount of reagent will mix in mortar and pestle for a few minutes and press into pellets and fire it in platinum crucible. So initially, the mixtures were heated overnight at 1000 Celsius to decarbonate the calcium. Samples were then reacted at 1400 to 1500 Celsius for three days in air with intermittent regrinding in order to establish the condition required to attain equilibrium. So for sample characterization, phase analysis and structure determination was carried out using X-ray powder diffraction, Stowe Steady P diffractometer, with internal silicon standard. For electrical properties measurement, sintered pellet were polished and platinum electrode pasted onto opposite pellet surfaces before annealed at 900 Celsius in air for one hour. So low temperature impedance measurement were obtained in vacuum using the cryostat Oxford impedance analyzer. For high temperature measurement, samples were placed in ceramic compression jig inside a high temperature tube furnace. Impedance measurement were performed using hollered packet and solatron frequency response analyzer. Data were corrected for overall geometry and data analysis were obtained using the software program ZView. For results and discussion for phase identification, the figures shows the experimental XRD patterns of the calcium tantalate and the solid solution. The patterns were indexed on hexagonal unit cell. All the patterns correspond to XRD pattern matching the reported calcium tantalate ICDD PDF card. So the limit of solid solution is X equal to two since X equal to 2.5 phase does not exist. For lattice parameters of the sample are determined from all peak position using read value refinement and the best fit leads to the unit cell dimension as shown in the table. So as you can see, the unit cell parameters and the volume are increased with the increasing of niobium content. So the despacing increase and causing the powder lines of the whole pattern to shift to lower values of 2 theta due to the increasing of the lattice parameters. So the changes in the unit cell parameters are governed by the relative sizes of the niobium ions that replace the tantalum in the solid solution mechanism. As you can see from the table that the reaction condition for each of the samples are different. For calcium tantalate, we applied the sintering temperature is at 1500 as well as for x equal to 1. But as the niobium content increased to 2, the sintering temperature is at 1400. But the duration increased compared to the x equal to 0. So calcium tantalate phase was detected at 1350 Celsius for x equal to 0 and 1 whilst for x equal to 2, the phase was identified at 1300 Celsius together with unreacted raw materials. So the increasing niobium content contributes to faster reaction and lower firing temperature. Longer firing times required for the most niobium content sample. So for impedance analysis at low temperatures, the impedance measurement has been carried out at 10 Kelvin to 320 Kelvin for all composition. The capacitance data are independent of frequency for A and temperature for B. So the samples are highly insulating with the value of resistance R is greater, much, much greater than 10 power of 9 ohm.
So this is the results of impedance analysis at low temperature, but at different temperature range from room temperature to 400 Celsius, which all the composition showed similar trend of frequency and temperature independent behavior. So the capacitance plateaus are approximately 3.1, 3.5, and 4.0 picofarad, 4x equal to 0, 1, and 2, respectively, which indicate the response of bulk capacitance. So for all samples, they all show the same trend at this temperature range. So the capacitance and the permittivity values obviously increase with the increasing niobium content. So the figure shows the capacitance data for the calcium tantalum 2 niobium 2 oxide sample. So for 500 Celsius and above, all samples showed increasing capacitance value with a decreasing frequency. It's here, the dispersion here. So for x equal to 2, appears to have the most pronounced increment of 10 power of negative 11 to 10 power of 10 compared to other samples. So this increment may be associated with the interfacial or grain boundary or bulk capacitance or the non-ideality of the bulk response represented by CPE. Well, this is the comparison of the complex plane plot for all the samples at high temperature, where each produce a broad and overlapping arcs. But for x equal to 2, two arcs were detected. And obviously, you can see this is maybe the green boundary and this is the bulk. They are overlapping with each other. So for bulk capacitance at high frequency, by extrapolating the capacitance data at 1 megahertz to infinite frequency, an estimation value of bulk capacitance can be determined. So we do a comparison measurement permittivity at gigahertz and megahertz. There is a lot of comparison differences between these two data. For conductivity analysis, this is the results of the activation energy for different composition. So total conductivity was measurable only at 600 Celsius and above. So for the equivalent circuit analysis, it is crucial to analyze the electrical properties of the sample to identify which parameters contribute to the impedance data that either electrode effect, drain boundary, or other possibilities. Okay, for samples at temperatures 10 Kelvin to 400 Celsius, the equivalent circuit of the experimental data can be fitted or modeled using the simple capacitor circuit as shown here. So all the low temperatures data are fitted or modeled using this circuit. For the intermediate one, the appearance of high frequency dispersion admittance as well as low frequency dispersion suggested the inclusion of the CPE in the circuits. While at high temperature between 650 to 700 Celsius, the bulk resistance began to appear and observe, therefore, the electrical circuit can be represented by the circuit here. But for x equal to 2, data for 725 Celsius and above were best modeled using non debar response circuit as shown below, with the R2 is the resistive grain boundary and the C2 here, which is attributable to grain boundary response. So for conclusion, the synthesis of fish pure calcium tantalate and analogs have been achieved. Electrical properties of the sample have been successfully measured at a wide range of temperature 10 Kelvin to 800 Celsius. Of all samples, X equal to 2 exhibit the highest permittivity compared to others. 
parameters contribution and the equivalent circuit for each data at different temperature have been identified. A simple capacitor is used to feed the data at low temperature. And as the temperature increased, the circuit become more complex and the inclusion of CPE element and the show up of brain boundary at high frequency for X equal to two sum. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, thank you very much for uh, Dr. Uh, Noor Fadlina. Uh, is there any question from the audience? Any question from the audience? Please ask uh, Dr. Uh, Fadlina. Okay, so if you don't have, we don't have, if you don't have any questions, we, uh, we uh, I mean, we we shall have a good round of applause for Dr. Fadlina for her presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Fadlina. Uh, so can we move into the next presenter? Uh, is uh, Miss Athena Husna Binti Abdullah? Hello. Hello. Is my voice here? Yes, we can hear you. Sorry. Okay. Okay, now I share my screen. Right. Can you see my screen? Okay. Oh, okay, we can continue. Nice. Sorry, thank you for the trouble. Right. 
Assalamualaikum and uh, good evening to all. And thank you to Prof. Dr. Wan Jeffrey. I'm Atina Husna binti Abu Wahripain, a postgraduate student from Photonic Research Center, University Malaya. And today I will share with you my work, which is a transmission line measurement TLM of metal contact for two-dimensional molybdenum disulfide and MOS2 nanoflakes deposited by chemical vapor deposition free technique. So how this work started is a few years back during my internship at Petronas Gas Perhat, I had an opportunity to learn and handle some sensing equipment, which is inductively copper plasma mass spectroscopy, ICPMS, and flame atomic absorption spectroscopy, FAS. And then I realized that uh, this sensing equipment really required uh, extensive sample preparations and also it uh, required personal technician just to educate the analysis. So what we want to have in future is we want to have a portable and reliable 2D material based sensor. However, to connect the 3D world with 2D materials, it required excellent communication link, which is a contact that provide remarkable electrical properties. So this sensing equipment that I learned in my internship is to sense the heavy metal, iron, heavy metal ions. And the figure in the left here shows the, de uh, shows the data from Departments of Environment 2017. It shows the heavy metal pollution in Malaysia River. This heavy metal is become serious uh, environmental issue due to our rapid development and also all water piping contaminations. And as you can see here, the highest heavy metals element is hosed by arsenic, which is 46% and the least are mercury and plumber. So the work, this work, we just want to have a very low contact resistance. Okay. So here is the outline. My presentation today, we break into five parts, which are introduction, purpose, methodology, results, and the last one is conclusion. For the first part, introductions, I will talk briefly about 2D material. As we know that um, a family of 2D material includes the MDC, graphene, and black phosphorus. And the 2D materials that we are interested to study is transition metal dichalcogenide, which is the combinations of transition metal and calcogenide atom that have general chemical formula of MX2. And the examples of MOS, the examples of TMDC are MS2 and WS2. One of the most advantage of 2D material, especially for sensing application, is because they have sensitive surface state due to ultra thin planar structure where electrons or holes are confined to a plane of atomic thinness that makes them very sensitive to surrounding environment and this can be fast changes in optical electronics and other properties as you can see here here is the basic crystal structure of 2HTMD this is the top view and the side view and you can see it has a sandwich like structure meaning that the transition metal, the purple ball here, is sandwiched by the calcogenite atom. So to measure the contact resistance, I use a very simple uh, method, which is rectangular transmission line measurement, TLM method. So you can see here is the schematic diagram of TLM test structure. This is the top view and the current voltage measurement on sample. You can see that I use a two-point probe method to measure the current here. So the metal pad separation, usually when we design the TLM mask, the metal pad separation is varied, while the length and the width of the metal pad are kept constant. So from the measurement, we can extract some uh, resistance parameters that we are interested. We plot the total graph resistance versus the pad separation, the metal pad separations. And the, from the plot, we can extract the resistance, such as the sheet resistance. It is basically the multiplications of slope and the width of the metal pad. 
And the second one is uh, contact resistant. It is basically the y-intercept of the total resistance plot. The next one is the specific contact resistance. It's, it is the multiplications of transfer length and sheet resistance. So what is actually the transfer length? Transfer length is uh, also known as effective length. It is the average distance that an electron or holes travels in the semiconductor beneath the contact before it flows into the current. So how we want to get the transfer length? It is from extrapolations of graph and then we can get the transfer length of the metal contact. So moving on to the purpose. The first one, we want to observe the optical properties of uh, spray 2D and moist 2 nanoclick by using a spray coating. And the characterization that we did is UVVs, SRD, and Raman. The second one is we want to observe the behavior of different metal, which is silver and gold contact to the 2D and moist 2 nanoclick deposited on substrate. And the last one is the LM analysis. We want to calculate the resistant values such as uh, contact, sheet and specific contact resistance. So the next part is the methodology. So first thing first, we need to prepare the 2D and moist 2 solution first. It is uh, just we uh, mix the powder and the other two solvents and then we mix it together and then we sonicate it about eight to nine hours before we centrifuge for 20 minutes. And after that, uh, we produce a greenish 2D MOS2 solutions. So this, these solutions, I kept it in the lab room at room temperature and it shows uh, no precipitations or no gradations after a few weeks. After preparing the solution, we spray the MOS2 onto the, onto the sample but the sample need to be uh, heated on hot plate to facilitate the evaporation process. So the, the spray coating deposition is done under a control condition with a control parameter. So after that, we make a metal contact using electron beam evaporations using our design TLM mask. And then the last one, uh, we did some characterizations and measurement, as I mentioned, the characterization that we made is SRD, UVV, Suraman, and the last one, the measurement is uh, TLM. So proceed to the result. So UVV is uh, done <coughs> to confirm the MOS2 solutions because we know that the MOS2 solutions have four significant peak, which is at around 674 and 612 nanometer. And the other two parts, uh, the other two peaks are below 500 nanometer. Also, the, from this UVV spectrum, we can estimate the final concentrations of MOS2 by using the beer lambert law. And then I can find out that my concentration is around 0 0.1053 gram per liter. And then the next one, the SRD result was used to determine the crystallinity of the spray 2D MOS2 nanostructure thin film, while the SI substrate used as a reference. It can be seen that the dominant peak reflecting 002 plane was observed at 14.4 degree and also can be identified as 2HMOS2, which is a semiconductor. So this reflects the nature of thin film, which consists of 2D MOS2 nanoplate, composed of mostly 002 plane. And the next one is the Raman characterization. So both the Raman spectra taken from the bulk powder and nanoflakes was normalized. And it's found that there is a red shifted in comparison to their bulk counterpart. So using the information provided by uh, previous research, this indicates a dominant pres presence of few layers, which is under five layers, less than five layers. And then we can make an estimation of the thickness of MOS2. It is around 3.25 nanometer, taking one layer is equal to 0 0.65 nanometer. For TLM analysis, uh, the, IV the IV curve shows here is a nearly symmetric and non-linear IV characteristic. So from the IV curve, we can obtain the total resistance. It is just the reciprocal gradient of the IV curve. So from the table, we can say that the contact resistance for gold is much lower than uh, the silver. The value is around 197.7. 
but bear in mind that my TLA mask is in millimeter range, so the value is quite higher than uh, previous work. So for the conclusion, the last part, we are able to produce 2D and MOS2 solutions by liquid exfoliation technique and deposited the solution by low cost spray method on substrate. And second one is the characterization UV -based. to estimate the final concentration of the final. solutions. As I did, you can say that the thin film consists of 2D and MOS2 nanoflake compost of for the Raman, the thickness is around less than five layers. And by TLM analysis, the value for contact resistant of silver and gold are 37 and 197 kilo ohm millimeter respectively. So I would like to thank uh, the project funder and many thanks to my supervisor, Associate Professor Dr. Rosalina Zakaria, Dr. Tan Chi Leong and Prof. Dr. Wan Haliza and also to all Plus Monic Lab members. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. Feel free to contact me at my email and phone number. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, Madam uh, Athena. Is there any questions for uh, Athena from the audience? Uh, hi, Prof. Wan. Yes. Wan Jeff. Maybe I have a question for yes, uh, Miss Athena. Yes. Yeah. Uh, from your presentation, uh, thank you for your presentations, first of all. And from your presentation, you show the value of the contact resistance, right? Yes. And you show the gold compound is significantly better than the silver. Yes. So have you done any statistical analysis? Uh, so far, not yeah. because this is just a preliminary result that we have done. But in the future, maybe we can do it, Dr. Liu. Ah, yeah, it's better for you to do some statistical analysis. That's how you can you can show uh, it is significantly different. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any questions for uh, Madam Athena Husna? Okay. If there's no questions. Uh, we have a good round of applause for Madam Athena Husna for her presentation. And uh, so then if there is no more presenters, then we conclude this session for this uh, evening. Thank you very much for your attendance and see you soon. Thank you very much. Prof. Wanja, we have another two invited, Prof. Oh, uh, yeah. what is it? We have Dr. Alia and Dr. Tan Kim Han. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Tan Kim Han just yeah. arrived. Uh, Yes, arrive, right, right. Okay. So uh we, we, we shall wait wait for him. Eh? Yeah, arrive already, bro. Yeah, okay. Welcome, Dr. Tan. Uh uh yeah. can you start your presentation? Sure, sure. Okay. So so you may start now. All right. So a very good days to our chairperson. Prof. Jeffrey and uh, uh, all the evaluators as well as uh, all the participants in these sections. Let me introduce myself. I'm uh, Dr. Tan. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, thank you to the community of the conference MICNC 2021 uh, because of uh, your invitation. So before I start my uh, presentations regarding my recent works, I uh, want to uh, just uh, give a brief uh, introduction. I'm currently based on uh, Research Center for the Nanomaterials and the Energy Technology, which is uh, under the School of Engineering and Technology uh, in the Sunway University. All right, I'm um, uh, just to give a brief uh, introduction on uh, our research centers. So um, we we provide uh, various uh, variations of our lab services, as you can see from the slide here. So. Um, from time to time, uh, all of you here, if you feel interested to, to use our lab services, uh, kindly uh, contact me. And of course, collaborations are always welcome. So this is the overview of the lab facilities that you can have loads. All right, so without further delays, I would like to start my uh, presentations regarding my recent work with the title, 
investigation of the improved uh, opticals and conductivity property of the PMMA Maxi, a nano composite steam firm for the electronics application. So this is the content on of my works. So we will start with the introductions. After that, we will proceed to the materials and the methods uh, of the fabrications of the nano composites. After that, we will proceed to the result and discussion, which is uh, mostly uh, deal with the morphological, uh, opticals and conductivity study of the composites. After that, we will have uh, uh, go through briefly on the obtained work outcomes. After that, uh, some of the research challenge and what will be the future uh, developments for my uh, materials, for my works. So I will start with the introductions. So uh, polymers, um, for example, the PE, PBA, PUs, um, they serve very well as a host materials, or uh, they can play as a role as a dielectric materials when the moments they combine with uh, two dimension materials, which uh, this 2D material acts as a filler. So at the end, they will form a very good uh, polymer matrix composite, which is uh, usually applied in the opto electronics, variable electronics, and etc. So among the most of, uh, I mean, uh, very common uh, polymers. So one of them, uh, polymethyl, methyl, methyl acrylic, PMMA, has the features uh, such as a uh, good transparency, chemical resistance, uh, mechanical flexibility, and so on. So this uh, advantage of this uh, PMMA, uh, together with its good compatibility, when we combine with uh, another's uh, main precursor material that are going to use it to com uh, to produce a the nano composite, which is the maxi. So this PMA have a very good compatibility. So and um, uh, based on the study uh, in uh, literature at present, there's a very limited study on this. Uh, uh, Polymer matrix composite by using the maxine, maxine as a filler. Um, there is some study, but it's more on the thermal and mechanical properties. So that's why um, this works. We use a maxine as a filler to combine with the PMMA. But uh, before I go further, I have to give a brief introduction on what is this uh, maxine, which is a, a quite a new a 2D nano materials that being introduced in the year of uh, 2012 but uh, this uh, maxine is basically is a 2d carbide or nitride material um, which is first uh, reported in the research field in the year of 2011 so after that the whole uh, new families of the, this uh, maxine is established starting uh, from the year of 2012 so of course we have the existing uh, 2d materials such as the clay graphite graphene but this maxine has uh, a very good uh, uh, properties, which I will introduce later on. So the general formula for this maxine is the MXT, which is M N plus one and X N T X. So the M is basically referring to the transition metals. Uh, there's a valuable choice uh, in the table, which we can use it to produce a maxine. Uh, but basically, they are transition metals, and then followed by the X, which is the carbon or the nitrogen atom and the TX stand for the terminations on the surface of the transition metals, the M that I mentioned just now. All right, so this is the introduction, this is the uh, uh, possible uh, structures of the maxines, which um, it can uh, present in a different uh, kind of structure as long as based on the molecular structure that I mentioned just now, M, X, M, N plus 1, X, and T, X. So the N, as I mentioned, is stand for the transition metals. And um, the transition metals uh, can have the, can be a titanium, vanadium, and so on, all right, which is uh, highlighted by the blue box. This is the possibles of the transition metals. And... Uh, Followed by the X, which is the carbon, okay. And if you can have a look on uh, details, for example, I pick up the M3X2TX. There is actually, uh, you have a three layer, three layer of the atom, which is made of the uh, transition metals, oh, sorry, transitions, uh, yeah, transition metal, which is uh, represented by the blue color. But in between them, there is uh, uh, 
a carbon atom or nitrogen atom, which is quite small, that is in between the transition metal layer. And then on top, at the bottom of the transition metal end, is, uh, is uh, coordinated by the surface termination iron, which is represented by the, the orange, orange uh, elements here. It could be halogen atom, it could be oxygen, and so on. So there is uh, quite a number of choices that we can uh, manipulate to produce uh, a variety of the maxi. So I will give a brief introduction on uh, basically how, how, how we can get a, a maxi. So we actually start from the uh, a max phase. Uh, we, we give a name as a max phase. So this is basically a, a ternary carbide or nitride uh, complicated uh, structure. So we, we name it as a max phase, which is MAX. And um, it's quite complex. In between the max phase layer, we have the layer of the atom, A atom. We represent it by the A atom. So this A atom could be uh, originated from the group three to group uh, seven, group seven, sorry, group six elements. So for example, it could be uh, aluminium in between the max phase. So by using the chemicals uh, etching reagents, we etch away this uh, aluminium atom layer, the A atom layer. So at the end, we will get uh, so-called uh, a maxi, right? Uh, it's a nano sheet uh, material. It's a multi-layer structure. Uh, with a certain of space in between the, this uh, uh, max phase, a uh, maxine layer. So the the good things of uh, these uh, maxines, with this two D material, right? They have uh, almost a uh, zero band gap. So it's a truly conducting a metallic uh, core with a zero band gap. So this is the the, 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 the beauty of the maxine. As you can take a look, it's uh, this is the FE, FEM uh, image on the. Um, the maxi is quite similar to graphene, yeah, because it has a larger surface area. It's a multi-layer structure um, uh, layer of the, of the of the compound. So uh, the good thing is, its a metallic conductivity it can be as high as twenty k siemens per cm. I'm talking about this uh, metallic conductivities, uh, which is such a high value in the group of two uh, D materials, right? In the in the in the in the in the field of two D nanomaterials, so it's considered very high. And it has a very good uh, hydrophysicity nature uh, because of the terminated surface on the on the maxine itself. Uh, as I mentioned just now, there is uh, uh, some kind of uh, termination ion, N ion, which is belong to group seven, and also uh, some oxygen hydroxyl. That is the one that make them uh, become a, I mean, to have a hydrophysicity nature. Of course, larger surface area, and uh, usually they apply in the energy storage, solar system, and so on. So this is a summary of the key property of the maxine. So um, it was very good uh, material because it has a very high metallic electrical conductivity. And another thing that I wish to highlight because quite a lot of uh, good property on this material, uh, it really can give us a very wide control to call, uh, to control the property of the maxine uh, by uh, varying the composition and the structure because of the available choice that you can use it to, to, to construct, to, to, to produce uh, a maxim. So uh, in my works, uh, we, um, we use a one gram of the max phase. This max phase, uh, it could be a, a, a ternary carbide or nitride, but what we are using is a very established uh, max phase. This is Ti3 aluminum C2, titanium and aluminum C2. So uh, we mix with the uh, a chemicals uh, etching reagent, which is the ammonia um, ammonia uh, biforate in the two molecular concentration under a certain setting in the magnetic stirring mode. Okay, okay. After a certain period, after that, we I mean the final solution is added with the NOH uh, because one adjusts the pH. After that, will be followed by a series of uh, filtration, rinsing, and uh, sanctifications. At the end of this uh, second stage, basically we get uh, uh, the maxim. Uh, once we extract the supernatums, uh, after the process of sanctification, we get the supernatum and then we dry it. So the powder actually is uh, what we get, uh, we call it as a maxim. But uh, we do a further process uh, by using the DMSO. It's a very common uh, solvent in the lab. Uh, just to introduce the delamination process because we want to uh, increase the space between the 
uh, a multi-layer structure so they have to have a certain space in between uh, the nano shape um, uh, that is for the good of the high conductivity that is the purpose we want to increase the spacing that's why we use the dmso to introduce a bigger molecule so that they will uh, enter into the space between the sheet of the maxim that would increase the spacing so that at the end we will get this what we call the delimited maxim basically we want to get a single flag of the maxim uh, the worst we can have a few uh, a layer of the flag of the maxim so this is the uh, the technique the quite simple straightforward as mentioned by Dr. Melinda, one of the uh, invited speaker in the, one of the sections that I joined. So straightforward, we use blending and casting. We mix the maxims solution that previously we synthesized with the PMA solutions. Um, after that, blending, stirring, solidifications uh, under certain settings. Then we cast the mixture in the battery disk and proceed, to, uh, proceed with the drying. So at the end, we get the nano composite info. So proceed to the SEM image. As you can see, this uh, figure 1A is a pure maxim. It's a pure maxim that we get. Of course, it's not that nice as what I showed in the, in the previous slide. It is not a fully delineated uh, maxim, but uh, I can say it's a partial uh, multi-layer structure of maxim together with a few uh, single I can say a few layer of the flag of the maxim. Um, they are not fully delimited because uh, to really fully delimited all the maxims is not that uh, it's not that uh, easy. Uh, even though this process is straightforward. All right, and then uh, figure one B is to represent the, the multi layers um, uh, maxim together with the delimited pure uh, maxim is uh, surrounded by the the PMMA. Okay, but the multi-layer structure is not that uh, obvious. But once we increase uh, the weight percentage of the maxim, uh, which is shown by the figure one C here, the multi-layers looks uh, obvious, right? And then when we proceed to increase from five weight percent of maxims all the way up to eight weight percent of maxim, the structures, I mean the overall uh, degree of disorder of the uh, nano compositing film is uh, is gone. The disorder is is gone. It's not that nice. Um, uh, anyway, the one F figure one F is to show you the the thin film that we get. That is with the highest of the maxim. The 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 mix of the maxim and the PMMA is not homogeneous. When the moments uh, uh, the percentage of the maxims is uh, increased. All right. This is the FTR analysis. The pure PMMA as compared to the others, another composite film firm, um, they're basically having a similar uh, FTIR band. Um, it means basically there is no any uh, chemical interaction between the PMMA and the maxim. Right? So one thing that I would like to uh, just point out that uh, there is a peak happened at uh, 1389 uh, wave number. That is uh, something uh, somewhere around here. It's not that obvious, but it's uh, shown here. Uh, this is something associated with the hydroxyl group. Uh, this is the peak that uh, we can use it to uh, to to indicate that there is the maxim present in the uh, nano composite infer. Of course, this is not the only method, but uh, yeah, the OH hydroxyl group uh, present over here that is uh, able to show that the maxim is uh, incorporated in the in the in the host material, the PMMA, right? And then another things that we find out that uh, when we combine, when we when we put all the we normalize all the result of the FTR spectrum of from the, all the samples, um, we we do stack them, we we we, we normalize them at a certain value. After that, we found that when we increase the maxim percentage in the nano composite terms, we just find out that uh, the peak intensity. The peak intensities uh, decrease with the increasing of maxim. So this suggesting that there is a physical interaction instead of a chemical interaction uh, between the PMMA and uh, and uh, and uh, and, uh, and the maxim, the filler. So this is uh, we proceed to the UEB absorptions. Um, the first black arrow is to show that the dominant peak, which is uh, usually found in the PMMA, 
uh, and then the big arrow is to show that uh, the absorption edge happened at the 375 uh, wave, uh, nanometers. Uh, this is basically referring to the carbon oxide band. All right, and then um, the blue and the green is actually the band that referring to the, um, the interactions of the maxins with the PMMA and the plasma resonance uh, that is uh, exhibited by the maxine at uh, 850 P. So that's uh, the peak that we can observe in the UVs. Right, then we proceed with the optical absorption coefficient. So basically this is uh, uh, basically this is something like we want to see how good uh, it can absorb uh, the, the incident wavelength. So we can find the optical absorption coefficients uh, represented by the alpha. So it is seems that uh, when we keep increasing the, the maxim uh, content, of course, uh, it is showing that the absorption coefficient is increasing. Um, that is because of the, of the presence of the maxim. So this is just to show that uh, the absorbent is good with the increasing of maxim. And then we proceed with uh, another analysis technique by uh, finding the extinction coefficient as a function of the photon energy. For these uh, nanocompositing firms, um, we find out that as well with the increasing of maxim, the intensity is higher, right? And this uh, abstinction coefficient also uh, very closely related to the absorption. Um, the higher the care value, uh, showing that the absorption is is good. All right, we proceed to uh, bank gap determinations for the nanocompositing firm. I'm sure everyone can know very well about the bank gap. This is something related to the electronic uh, conductivity uh, properties of the nanocomposite in firm. So we have we plot and uh, we determine that the bank gap actually, um, if compared to the pure PMMA, as according to in the initial study, of course we need to justify with the thickness, but uh, we found that uh, with the incorporation of maxims, the bank gap is uh, reduced. Okay, it's reduced to. Uh, from 4.4 all the way up to 2.43. So uh, again, with a uh, higher content of the maxim in the nano compositing flow, um, the bank gap is actually uh, reducing gradually, okay? Because of the, uh, the maxim, which uh, it has a uh, uh, transition metal of the titanium. The transition metal itself, they have the surface terminations. Uh, it's actually modified the density state of the of the surface transition method of titanium. So this will actually uh, uh, give them a very good uh, conductivity. Uh, of course, uh, the relationship of the bank gap with the uh, maximum con uh, content is not, uh, is not a constant, it's a non-linear relation, as you can see. But overall, the bank gap is uh, reduced with the uh, uh, increase of the amount of the maximum. So I will proceed with the result and discussion on the, the electrical uh, analysis on the nanocompositing firm. So we use uh, EIS, electrochemical and impedance uh, spectroscopy, to conduct our uh, uh, to get this uh, nightcloth plot. We call it as a nightcloth plot, where we have uh, imagery and real uh, components, as you can see. So we will have a, a semi circle in general right and then followed by an inclined line at the lower frequency range but uh, only for the uh, nano composite with uh, two weight percent all the way up to eight weight percent maxim uh, showing this kind of trend right and uh, the irregularity uh, is the one that caused the impedance trend that turn into something like a deviated uh, de divide relationship. Because if the, the real divide relationship would be a very nice semicircle followed by the inclined line. But this is something like a bit like a, a distorted. That's why uh, something like deviated uh, divide relation. This is because of the irregularity of the nano composite, the thickness, uh, the surface roughness of the of the maxim, I mean uh, surface roughness of the thin firm itself that caused the, the pattern. Or what we call something like a derivative uh, uh, divide relationship. But uh, the idea for this uh, analysis because we want to get uh, some kind of uh, resistance, we call a bug resistance for the thin firm. So we expected 
uh, from here, which is represented by the RB, right? Um, from a, a certain uh, method, from the intersection between the plot uh, that is uh, associated with the low frequency N and the high frequency N of the straight line, which is, uh, I just uh, show you the RB here. So that's how we get the bug resistance. But however, with the weight percentage higher than 8 weight percent, which is a 10 to 15 weight percent of the maxim, it shows that uh, the resistance is uh, very small. That's why I have to enlarge this region where we can have something like a, a vertical line showing here. Uh, this is basically, uh, the resistance is, is, is very low uh, because it's kind of reflect in here. That's why I enlarge it. So, so uh, this shows that uh, very low resistance that we can get when we have uh, increased the maximum content in this uh, uh, number composite info. Um, in order to verify that uh, the result that we get from this uh, ingredients uh, spectroscopy, um, the EIS spectra, for these two uh, materials, we uh, conduct a very simple uh, a measurement that uh, we, we find the voltage against the current by using the multimeters. Because the resistance is very low, that's why uh, the multimeters can give a certain value. So we try to uh, verify the value over here. If we find we find that it is a, a straight line, and the resistance that we get is quite matched with the value that we get from the EIS, the RB value for these two samples. Right. So uh, this is the a formula that I use it to uh, conventional uh, um, formula to use to find the conductivity and resistivities. So this is the table showing that there are uh, respective parameters showing that the thickness of all the nanocompositing firm with the corresponding uh, band gap and the bulk resistance that we get from the, the electrochemicals ingredients EIS. And um, we use the multimeters just to determine the two samples, 10% and 50 weight, uh, 15 weight percent of the maximum. So that two value is quite uh, near to each other. And uh, from there, we find the conductivities value, and uh, we I showed in the figure ten here, which is the the conductivities value in in as a function of the concentration of the maxim. So it is very uh, obvious uh, when the maxim's content is increased from the eight weight percent all the way up to ten percent, um, the conductivities is actually uh, increased uh, drastically. If we compare to the uh, the value that get in the in the in the richer for as for the pure PMMA as a, uh, I need to highlight I just compared to the pure PMMA so the conductivity uh, improvement is at least uh, three thousand times it's at least three thousand times but anyway uh, we have to consider the thickness of the PMMA uh, some of the paper they never review the, the thickness of the PMMA of the of their work uh, but some is slightly higher and some is slightly lower our uh, nano composite uh, dim firm that we use is in the range of uh, eight micrometer. This is very big, All right? So this is a list of the equations that I use for the optical parameter. Just uh, let you all have to look a lot. Okay. So the maxim actually uh, able to uh, really good. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, improve the properties of. Uh, uh, electric, uh, I mean the conductivity property of this uh, PMMA. Um, uh, previously, um, we study other polymers. Uh, for example, I even study the PVA combined with the maxim. And uh, but these times, uh, yeah, the PMMA and the maxims actually have a very good uh, uh, combinations uh, where they can give a very good uh, conductivity. And uh, because the maxim itself. The maxim itself is actually um, the nature of maxim. That that actually can um, uh, increase the light absorption uh, capability of the of the final product, right? As what we can see from the calculators, all the optical uh, absorption coefficients, the optical analysis uh, data. So it actually offer a way that we can tune uh, the optical uh, parameters uh, by modifying the percentage of the maxim, of course. And we even can vary the uh, 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 different uh, elements to be a transition metals. And even we can conduct a surface functionalization 
we can conduct a surface functionalization on the on the on the Maxim. It will help to uh, modify uh, further for their uh, conductivity, and even they can add as a sensor as well. But uh, my recent work for this work, we focus more on uh, uh, conductivity and the optical uh, property. So. Yeah, the, the Nara Composite Infant actually very good conductivity improvement. They're able to show a very good one, uh, which is at least 3,000 times uh, compared to the pure P PMMA. Right? The highest that we can achieve is 1.35 times 10 about negative 3 simum per meter. Uh, of course, with the highest uh, percentage of the uh, maximum. And uh, the factor that uh, contribute uh, the conductivity improvement is basically is the interface that form between the PMMA and the maxim and uh, the modification of the electronic structure of the PMMA and the defect that introduced by the maxim itself. So that is the challenges. We have to, uh, if we're able to precisely control the surface combinations on the maxim itself before we mix with the PMMA, that would be the great. And we even, if we're able to uh, get uh, a good efficiency in uh, delimiting all the maxim layer where they have a certain space, that would be the best to improve the, the conductivity of the maxim. At the end, that would be a very good conductivity for the final product, the nanocompositing firm. And uh, yeah, that is the last few production. Yeah, this is another uh, concern if we uh, able to have a large scale production of this another competing firm, which is uh, would be would be would be nice. But because of the the, the amount of the maxim itself, so this is would be another concern that we need to work with. And um, further electrochemical analysis that we will carry on in future, which is the capacitor test, a charge discharge. Uh, these are the necessary uh, tests where we want to evaluate the electrochemical performance of the of the team firm. And of course, uh, we will have to include certain uh, thermal investigations. It is in involving the TGN and DAC, uh, where we can actually uh, to help us to confirm the type of the surface terminations on the maxim. By the way, we can using the XPX as well. We will we will we will plan to use it. And this once we identify the surface terminations on the maxim, uh, that would be nice, and uh, it would be uh, better for us to control the property of the of the maxim. But uh, for this work. Uh, the, the the possible uh, surface terminations on the on the on the maxim itself is uh, uh, is is mostly on the hydroxy OH and also the uh, fluoride okay F because the during the uh, during the etching process we are using uh, the ammonium bifluoride that's why uh, that's some of the uh, terminations iron over there so um. Before I end my slide, I would like to thank you for the support of the Research Center, the RCMF, and uh, my head of uh, superiors, and uh, some of my colleagues as well. So that's all for my um, uh, uh, presentation of my recent work. So uh, thank you. One. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Have, uh, is there any question for Doctor Tan on his talk? Uh, I have, Prof. Okay. Uh, thank you, Doctor Tan Kim Han, for the great. Question, uh, question in the chat box. Uh, my question is how you perceive the maxim performance in comparison with uh, graphene and phosphorine. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Alia. Um, in terms of performance of the maxine as compared to uh, graphene and uh, uh, phosphorine, a uh, maxine, um, which is, uh, you can actually uh, can, can find out the, the conductivity. The conductivity, the electrical conductivity is, is much more higher than the, the graphene and also the phosphorine. But um, because right now I'm using the maxim to compare uh, to combine with the uh, PMMA. So um, if let's say the maxim itself, if you just compare the maxim to the material with the graphene and phosphorus, uh, the maxims will be much more better. 
And in the additional, um, the Maxine itself actually has a very good uh, mechanical properties. It's actually, um, they can uh, mix very well with the water. So this will be very good in the uh, fabrication process later on. For, for example, for uh, battery applications, for certain uh, modification of a certain uh, uh, like, uh, like the energy storage application purpose, we can actually easy to process uh, the, the maxims, which is in the solution phase. So uh, this is the advantage as compared to uh, as compared to the coffee when we want to compare to the maxims. So I hope that I answer uh, Dr. Alia answer. Yes, thank you. Uh, sorry, I your question. Okay. Sorry. Yep. Uh, sorry, Prof. Your 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 voice is not that clear. Okay, I just took this from Doctor Dave. Uh, since the since the result showed that the sample was not fully delaminated, how could you keep improve the delamination integrity of the machine? Sorry, Prof. The question is not not clear. Uh, maybe maybe I can read for Prof. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for excellent talk, Dr. Tan. Since the SCL results show the sample are not fully delaminated, how could your team improve the delamination degree of the machine? Yeah, thank you. At this point uh, we, in our work, right, we are not fully to measure uh, how much the degree of, degree of the delamination. But one thing for sure, um, even in others uh, uh, work that related to maxim, it is uh, impossible to get 100% efficient, efficient in uh, delimited, I mean, in fully delimit uh, the maxim itself. So um, at this point, uh, for my for my sample, uh, basically the maxim itself is is consists of uh, a partially multi-layer structure as well as uh, a, a delimited uh, maxim. So uh, if 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 we want to even improve, uh, we have a better uh, delimination uh, effect. Um, we can use the others uh, elimination agent. We can use the others uh, solvent, but the solvent may not appear good with uh, a PMMA. That's a reason at this point uh, we use the DMSO because we want to concern the co uh, compatibility between the the the, the, the maxine and the and the PMMA. That's why uh, we use the DMSO. But uh, if let's say we can we can precisely control and increase the gap between. Uh, the nano sheet of the maxim, all right, by introducing this uh, delamination agent, so the conductivity will be will be I can say, um, it will be it will be more than twenty thousand uh, siemens per meter as according to the research, because uh, these materials uh, actually is is a very hot topic I can say, uh, is is this is material is just invented ten years ago, so uh, continuous research is ongoing. So uh, that is what we have to figure out the dimension agents. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lee. Okay, cool, thank you. Prof. Wang, would you like to ask your questions? I saw your questions here. Yeah, I can read the questions. It's okay, Prof. Yes, yes, Prof. Uh, regarding your questions, actually, we can use the maxims uh, uh, modified with other photonic materials. Definitely, yes. Without any leaching into yeah yeah, if we if we don't uh, try to relate with the aqueous solution, it's fine as well. Because the maxim actually uh, we can uh, we can make the maxim in solution in the in the aqueous base as well as non aqueous base as well. So it should not be a problem. Am I answer your uh, your questions, bro? Uh, prof, prof, we actually we we, uh, we cannot hear you, Prof. We just, we're losing your. We cannot hear your voice here. Oh, maybe you can type, Prof. No. If you have uh, further questions. I think it should be no more. I guess. Okay. Uh, 
So can we have uh, the next speaker? Thank you very much, Dr. Tan. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to ask uh, the assistant of uh, Nur Hazira to play my pre-recorded video. Okay. Thank you. Please unmute your microphone. We cannot hear. Hazira, unmute your my microphone. Can you hear? Yes, Hazira. Yes, Hazira. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, okay. Hazira, it's okay. Uh, I will present live because the videos uh, that you played have no sound. It's not edible. Yeah, it's not the audible. Uh, the, the, my my pre-recorded video that you play is not mm -hmm. audible. So oh, I will... Okay, I try to share again. Maybe I share the entire screen. Sure, thank you. Which, uh, yes. Is it okay? okay. Yes, I repeat again. Thank you. For offering this great platform, an opportunity for all the researchers, scientists and students to share our insight. Uh, we can gain new knowledge as well as getting to know a new collaborator prospect here. Hello, I'm Nur Alia. Binti Hamizi from Nanotechnology and Catalysis Research Center, University of Malaya, Malaysia, which is acronym is known as NanoCat Research Center. My humble sharing for today is on two six quantum dot. 
Prospect in Light Emitting Diode Application, LED application. Now, let me introduce you to the candidate of interest for today, which is Group 26 Quantum Dot. As we all know, Quantum Dot is a semiconductor material which uh, nano dimension, which uh, that, that possess nano dimensions, which have an optical and electronic properties that differ from its uh, bulk particle due to quantum mechanic or quantum confinement effect, which will be effective within one to 100 nanometer dimension. Although they are crystal, they behave more like individual atoms uh, like in material sign language, they have the, this nickname, they call it an artificial atom, which is emphasizing their singularity, uh, having bounds, discrete uh, electronic state like naturally occur in atom or molecule. In general, quantum dot can be differentiated into four classes which is the traditional quantum dot is the cadmium based quantum dot. However, due to the risk of cadmium leaching that may cause dangerous toxicity and carcinogenic effect, the industry are moving towards a greener alternative such as silica quantum dot, carbon quantum dot, and also cadmium free quantum dot. Now, what is silica quantum dot? Well, silica quantum dot show good biocompatibility and it's reported to be 10 times safer than cadmium-based quantum dot under UV radiation and possess three discrete photoluminescent bands, infrared, red light, and also blue light. And how about carbon uh, type quantum dot? It is it was discovered at 2004 by Zoo Research Group. They also show great potential in biological application and possess unique converted photoluminescent properties, which is an exceptional properties for solar cell application. Whereas for cadmium-free quantum dot, researcher had developed this type of quantum dot in the past few decades, such as indium phosphate, zinc sulfate, uh, copper sulfate, zinc sulfate, silver selenide, and many more. It possess, it shows good biocompatibility and excellent optical properties as well. Among these classes of quantum dot that promise biocompatibility uh, and by compatibility and uh, safer mode, uh, this will never dispute in the significance of the traditional quantum dot, based quantum dot, that always ahead in serving a great tunability in optical and electronic properties. The cadmium based quantum dot always the first candidate that serving superior optoelectronic properties. Now, two six quantum dot serve with names which define as semiconductor nanocrystal that assemble from group two and group six chemical compound from particle table for example we have two six quantum dot uh, the example of two six quantum dot are cadmium selenide quantum dot cadmium is from group two compound and selenium is a charcoal genetic compound which is from group six so let me highlight on two six quantum dot properties. Why it's so uh, promising for optoelectronic and LED applications. So this group quantum dot have unique optical and electronic features which comprise of high quantum yield, high molar extinction coefficient, large effective, large effective stop shift, Rock excitation and narrow emission profile, high resistance to reactive oxygen mediated photobitching, and are against metabolic degradations. This group of quantum dots are fluorophores, nanocrystal, 
whose uh, excitation and emission is that basically distinct than classical organic fluorophores. The unique properties of this quantum dot appear almost exclusively due to their size regime in which they are uh, existed. Again, this group of quantum dot obey the quantum mechanic principle of three-dimensional confinement of a uh, charge carrier, electron and hole that determine novel quantum dot phenomenon which allow the tunability of optical and electronic properties which are sensitive to their size, shape and material compositions of the quantum dot. So, what is the requirement in a uh, light energy diode application that met by this group of quantum dot? First is the ability to permit the modulating of the band gap energy. This type of, this group of quantum dot have an intrinsic energy band gap that decide require wavelength or of radiation absorption and emission spectra. The smaller quantum dot result in broader band gap structure and vice versa and vice versa and the color of light which the quantum dot admit is directly connected to its size the bigger dot cause longer wavelength lower frequency and the redder light while the smallest dot produce shorter wavelength higher frequency and the bluer light it also possess a distinctive light excitation and emission which obey the quantum confinement effect. It has high efficiency of light generation process, uh, exceptional high quantum efficiency that promote light generation process. So now, how to make uh, this group of quantum dots stand out among uh, the new developed quantum dots such as silica, silica quantum dot, carbon quantum dot and cadmium free quantum dot. So I will propose an enhancement of quantum efficiency of intrinsic quantum dot and stabilize the surface of the quantum dot towards biocompatibleness. First uh, is to passivate the quantum dot particle surface to hinder the free electron trap phenomenon by dangling or light. One of the effort was by promoting an organic ligands such as oleic acids and other fatty acids based surfactant. The surface of the surface preservation can also be achieved by introducing a, a core shell heterostructure type, which is the introduction of quantum uh, the introduction of quantum dot that consists of broader energy as shell. For example, I have here uh, the cadmium selenide as a core and zinc sulfide as a shell, which zinc sulfide possess a broader band gap energy compared to the cadmium selenide quantum dot. And this will lead to the confining, confining of electron and hole into the core region, which will enhance the photoluminescent quantum yield and photobleaching stability. This will be beneficial uh, to the luminescence quantum dot devices, including luminescent solar concentrator and light emitting diode LED. I will discuss further on the classification of type 1 and type 2 and their inverted constructions of core shell quantum dot afterwards. Another approach in surface enhancement in quantum dot system is by introductions of impurity or dopants to quantum dot lattice. This is an effective method to tune the surface state, energy level and electrical, optical and structural and magnetic properties. The dopant is intentionally introduced to control the behavior of the material lies at the heart of many technology. The energy from absorbed photon can be efficiently transferred to the impurity, then quickly localize uh, the excitations and suppressing the undesirable reactions on the nanocrystal surface. For example, the incorporations of zinc selenide 
with other transition metals such as manganese, nickel, copper, shows improvement in the photoreactivity in photocatalysis process. Dopant serve as a solution for non-radiative re recomb re recombination center for photoexcited charge carrier that will increase the luminescent efficiency and material stability, whereas encapsulation with liposome structure reported to be a great effort to combat the chemical leaching and promote biocompatibility character to the quantum dot system. Now, let's look at the evolutions of surfactant use in the synthesis of colloidal 2,6 quantum dot. In early 19th century, scientists are reported to be using tetramethylsilin, TMS, base surfactant to produce colloidal cadmium selenide quantum dot in complex organic metallic uh, method where cross-cut three dot reactions uh, using complex chemical structure precursor meat to be employed. Not later than that, phosphine based surfactant were introduced by Bowendy and his research group and trioctylphosphine or trioctylphosphine oxide TOP or TOPO and octavicin have been a conventional surfactant in productions of two six quantum dot by via inverse Michel approach till this date. TOP or TOPO reported to produce quantum dot with narrow particle size dispersion and good tunability. In early 20th century, researchers had reported to adopt an organic approach uh, via fatty acids, this surfactant like oleic acid and lionic acids as surfactant and paraffin oil as a solvent in hot injection uh, techniques, synthesis technique. Oleic acid found to be serving a cheaper and environmental friendly method compared to the phosphine based methods since uh, uh, TOP and TOPO were reported to be toxic material that can cause toxic uh, pneumonitis and dermatotysin effect. All right. We come back to oleic acid factor. Even though it may serve as a green approach, but it is not a level up contender to TOP in serving a monodispersity of quantum dot particle. This may due to its linear hydrophobic MP field tail structure that hinder the constructions of uniform size micelle or nanoreactor. There's a new prospect, uh, a new prospect of two six quantum dot surfactant will be fatty acid based surfactant with chemical alterations of heterocyclic structure to create Y inverted MP field structure or even more than two non-polar tail MP field, MP field are possible to be chemically designed to emulate the structures of TOP. Now, I would like to extend our view for today on the construction of type 1, type 2 and their inverted type according to the uh, each alignment of the conduction and balance bands of the core and shell structure of quantum dot uh, as been illustrated here herein. Mm, in type 1 class classifications of core shell quantum dot, the uh, band gap of the core is smaller than that of the shell. Both the conduction and balance bands each of the core lies within the band gap of the shell which confine both electron and hole in the core. The electron and hole of excitant at the heterostructure interface occupy energy state within the core structure, which correspond to the lower available energy separations. The emission wavelength due to the reactive, uh, radiative electron and hole re uh, recombinations or decay within the core is a slightly redshift compared to the uncoated core uh, quantum dot. Uh, example of these construction materials are cadmium selenide core, 
and zinc sulfide uh, shell and also cadmium selenide core and cadmium uh, sulfide uh, shell. In reverse type 1 configuration, the core has a wider band gap than the shell and the conduction and valence band each of the shell lies within those of the core. The lowest available excitance energy separation occur when the charge carrier are localized in the shell, within the shell. Uh, changing the shell thickness will enable us to tune the emission uh, wavelength. Whereas in type two configuration, the wave, uh, the balance, the, the valence and conduction band each of the core, uh, uh, the core and the uh, the band each, uh, the 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 valence and conduction band each of the core are both lower or higher than the band each of the shell. So the lowest energy separations of electrons and hole will uh, occur when the hole is confined in the core valence bands and the electron is confined in the shell conduction band. The emission wavelength will be determined by the energy differences in this occupied state as shown in the uh, red arrow, uh, which will be at a lower energy than either of the individual band gaps. The emission wavelength can be significantly redshift compared to the unpassivated uh, core. Here I have summarized um, the comparisons character of the quantum dot uh, classification based on their band gap uh, alignment. The locations of carriers, quantum yield, stock shift, and the average uh, absor uh, absorption emission range, example of constructive materials, and some of their limitations are tabulated here. I would like to bring you to the most crucial character that met uh, the needs of light emitting diode LED application with uh, which possessed by type 1 for shell quantum dot heterostructure which is the ability to produce high quantum yield and long-term stability. Uh, on, top, on top of that, uh, the inverted type 2 could be the next prospect uh, with the right manipulations of core shell thickness formulation uh, we might have the delocalizations of the electronic wave function towards the shell or core to serve the needs of particular applications, which is LED. Now, let's look at the example on the surface modification effect. The introductions of oleic acid, uh, cap oleic acid capping to the cadmium selenide system shows uh, typical absorption and emission evaluations uh, evolutions of semiconductor material. Manganese dope cadmium selenide shows unique temporal evolutions of optical structure, smaller quantum dot with a strong stock shift transition and larger quantum dot shows anti stock shift transition. This band gap structure modification expected to induce by lattice string upon in introductions of the manganese dopant into cadmium selenide lattice. The, the interstitials of this uh, smaller, small um, um, manganese atom into the cadmium selenide lattice. The encapsulations of cadmium selenide quantum dot shows improvement of luminescent intensity with a slight redshift character, does it prove that the encapsulation's effort will not oppose any optical properties of quantum dot? Now, let's look uh, into the characters of uh, manganese dope cadmium selenide quantum dot that have been synthesized using chemical hot injection technique. Well, uh, quantum dot can be produced or synthesized uh, using two different forms, which is colloidals and epitaxial form. In my research, uh, I 
uh, I am inclined towards the colloidal quantum dot since it shows a great effect of an increase in uh, recombination efficiency that obtained by constructing an emissive layer in a single layer of quantum dot so that the electron and hole may be moved directly from the surface of electron transport layer and hole transport layer. Showing here is the extra pattern of three well-defined peaks which profiling the zinc blend hexagonal crystal structure. Another interesting feature is XRD diffraction is the in this XRD the uh, diffraction pattern is the shouldering effect at angle 18 to 20 degree that correspond to the institutions of manganese ion between cadmium selenide quantum dot lattice. Manganese ion has high tendency to fill these in interstitial sites of cadmium selenide quantum dot lattice due to a typical small size. Uh, it's between zero, uh, it's approximately 0 0.8 Armstrong compared to the cadmium ion uh, 0 0.95 Armstrong in size. This is interstitial phenomenon of manganese into cadmium selenide quantum lattice can be contribute to the lattice micro string, micro string and result in expansion or compressions of cadmium selenide core lattice. I'm also showing here the lattice profile of manganese dope cadmium selenide quantum dot in high resolution TEM microscopic image. It is interesting to note that the lattice strain density increase with the decreasing of uh, quantum dot size. This may due to the rise of quantum confinement effect in smaller quantum dot, which allow the stress induced by the lattice mixed mass to be scattered on the quantum dot surface. In addition, the large surface area permits stress to be distributed intensively to the constituent atom on the quantum dot surface. On the other hand, for larger quantum dot or bulk, the epitaxial stress tend to form a strain re relaxation uh, crystalline, crystalline, crystalline. This is because of the significantly large number of atoms to the number to the smaller amount of constituent atom are uh, enclosed by the epitaxial stress. The lattice strain phenomenon causes uh, the significant change in band gap energy, which is essential in manganese dope cadmium selenide quantum dot optical properties. The temporal, the temporal evolutions of manganese dope cadmium selenide quantum dot presented in uh, absorption and emission spectra. The optical band gap uh, behave negatively exponential to the growth of quantum dot size, whereas the excitation energy shows typical approximate uh, linear relations. The lattice string shows a crucial effect on the excitation uh, the excitant band uh, compared to the optical band gap. This is made due to the change in the hierarchy of the ground hole state and the first, excite, uh, the first excited hole state in such way uh, that both state cross or overlapping each other resulting in narrowing in the excitant band gap. This wave function overlapping behavior is intensely due to the implications of uh, strain effect on the cadmium selenide quantum dot. The separation and overlapping between interband phenomenon, phenomenon due to the institutions of manganese dot. And this interband alteration induced by the lattice strain may explain the narrowing in the carrier transition energy in manganese dope cadmium selenide quantum dot, which results in the narrow excitation band gap energy.
Well, I would like to conclude my sharing for today with this question. Does this develop two six quantum dots suit the needs of light emitting diode LED applications? Well, I personally will answer yes due to its exceptional tunable optoelectronic properties. It offers flexi flexibility, promised gamma color contrast, a brighter than competing technology that is known as uh, organic light emitting diode or LED. Plus, there are several established surface enhancement techniques that can be exploited to meet the biocompatibleness character. Thus, this surface enhanced technique will bring two quantum dot back in the leak as filter light for from light emitting diode LED to bed lit liquid crystal display LCD, quantum dot based LED for phototherapy, electroluminescent light source and quantum dot based light emitting diode for near field scanning optical mic microscopy application. So I come to the end of my sharing for today. I would like to take uh, this opportunity to thank the uh, organizing committee of MICNC again. Uh, congratulations with the organizing of this conference. So I would like to welcome a research collaborations in developments of cadmium selenide electrode for three chlorophenol detections in hydrogen harvesting. I welcome any questions from audience, if any. You can also drop me an email if you have any questions or interest in collaborating. I will do my level best to respond accordingly. Thank you and assalamualaikum. Take care, stay safe, stay healthy. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation, Dr. Alia. Uh, Dr. Ta have to leave first, but he has a question for you. Uh, the question is, is that the quantum dot materials applied in the latest LED displaying technology such as OLED and also micro LED? Yes. Okay. Uh, the answer to uh, Dr. Tang Kim Han question is a uh, yes. Is uh, as we know, uh, I'm 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 not sure whether I can, uh, you know, say it here the 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 brands, but it's already there. It's already uh, employed in the technologies and already been. Uh, the, the technologies of quantum dots is already applied in the light emitting diode uh, TV actually. It's already been marketed widely and it, you can uh, see that it have been um, what we call that uh, uh, using as the advertisement uh, catching uh, or selling point. But actually if we look at the the, we uh, look at the research or the uh, technology behind that. Uh, it, actually, the the use of quantum dot is not actually on the uh, light emitting diode technology itself. It's on the uh, filtrations and the bed light blue bed light application. So it's uh, kind of uh, frustrating, a bit frustrating for us in the. Uh, photonic and uh, quantum dot and semiconductor uh, researchers uh, to see that happen. But uh, in near future, inshallah, maybe we can have Malaysia uh, developing uh, the first, uh, the real uh, LED uh, quantum dot uh, based on quantum dot technology. Thank you, Dr. Liu and Dr. Tan Kim Han for the questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alia. I have one question. Uh, since before you ending your presentation, you mentioned about the toxicity of a substances, and but you, uh, it's glad that you you mentioned that there is organic camping, uh, capping and also the encapsulating agents that develop to combat this uh toxicity profile. Yeah, because we're concerned about the life cycle of our products. 
maybe you can uh, you can let us know why is the capping agent that people reported in the literature or, or um, about the Boston City concern overall? Yeah. Um, the concern on the uh, tra traditional quantum dot is the leaching of cadmium, cadmium itself. Uh, cadmium is known as the trichogenic uh, uh, material, not trichogenic, is uh, carcinogenic materials uh, can cause cancer. So what uh, the, the yes, uh, your concern is uh, right, Dr. Liu. Uh, what we try to uh, uh, target here is uh, we introduce an organic capping instead of the more toxic capping to uh, hinder this uh, leaching of the cadmium by introducing like uh, liposome uh, systems uh, as a capping or as a, what we call it as a factor for our quantum dot system. Thank you, Dr. Leo. Thank you, Dr. Alia. Um, uh, Prof. Jeff, uh, we, you are breaking out uh, from us, but I think may I uh, conclude this session on behalf of you. I would like to thank all uh, the speakers, uh, the speakers, the presenter, and audience. Uh, and uh, may I have the result from the IT team for our best presenter? Yes, um, the best presenter today goes to uh, Miss Atina Husna. Miss Atina Husna, congratulations. Am I correct, uh, Nurul Hajira? The winner yeah. is Miss. The, the winner is Miss Atina Husna. Congratulations, Miss Atina Husna. You are the best presenter for this session. So it's. Uh, I would like to uh, pronounce this session uh, dismissal. Uh, thank you. See you uh, tomorrow. Bye. Stay safe. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Prof. Wan. Thank you, Dr. Thank Aya. you, Prof. Wan Jeffrey. Assalamualaikum semua. Assalamualaikum.